The 67 Camaro is one of the iconic cars to come out of the US. However, on face value, it doesn't seem entirely suited to time attack style racing. We're here with Mike from Dussel Designs to talk a little bit more about this car and the changes that have been made to make it fast and a winning time attack car. So for a start, Mike, this car, we're at Optima Street Car Challenge, Ultimate Street Car Challenge. You've actually won this event uh, two years in a row, I understand. Yeah, we won it in 18 and 19, and then after that they made a rules change, so we kind of moved on, and we decided to go into the Pikes Peak Hill Climb, and we also do time attack racing because they're kind of hand in hand, and we use the time attack racing as development for the hill climb. Okay, so coming back to my first statement, 67 Camaro on face value maybe isn't the best handling chassis out there. Suffice to say, things have come a long way since uh, this rolled off the production line. What have you done to the chassis in order to actually optimise the suspension, the handling, the braking for a racetrack application? So one of the big problems with the 67 Camaro in its stock form is the weight distribution is way off. They're about 54% heavy in the front and they don't have ideal geometry. So honestly, I just kind of scrapped it all and I made something of my own. Uh, it took a bunch of design cues from Corvettes, but some of those cars are all designed to be production cars and we didn't really need to worry about that. We wanted to build something from scratch with a clean sheet of paper that would do exactly what we want. So we looked at what we wanted for our roll center heights, our camber gain, got all of that kind of figured out and what we wanted to do and then built the chassis from there. Okay, so essentially what we are looking at is a 67 Camaro body hung over a custom one-off full tube frame chassis. Correct, yeah. It's a started out where I ran the car with the Camaro chassis and I raced it in this series and everybody was saying there's no way you could ever take a Camaro and beat a Corvette with it, it can't be done. And I was like, challenge accepted. So, so put the Corvette uh, underbody on the, the Camaro body and you're away, well, essentially? We kind of took it what they had and said, how do we improve the Corvette suspension? And then we put it under the Camaro. So we made it even better than what the Corvette is. So our weight distribution is better than a Corvette. Our camber gains are better than a Corvette. So a lot of the stuff that's on this chassis, like we based it on the same upright, but the rest of the chassis is not. One of the things that's fantastic with this is it uses a cantilever suspension system. So we can drive the motion ratio wherever we want. We're like on a Corvette, you've run in a fixed motion ratio. They have a little bit of a digressive issue if you go to coilovers because of the extreme angle the shocks are at. We don't have to worry about that. So there are improvements in this chassis over what a Corvette would have. Okay, you've just mentioned a bunch of terms there. The, the first of them I want to dive into in a little bit more detail is, is that term camber gain and we do hear this discussed when it comes to suspension setups. What's that actually mean and what's the advantage for a racetrack application? Okay, so when a car is sitting static, it has a static camber. And then as that camber moves through compression, it's going to either lose or gain negative camber. Typically you want to gain negative camber and depending on your suspension architecture and how much travel you plan to run, it'll determine how much camber gain you really want to use. This car factory actually had camber loss. So that's the opposite terrible. of what we want. Yeah, it was absolutely terrible. So now we're able to dial in the correct amount of camber gain so that when the car rolls in a corner, we can actually keep the tire with the same static camber. So by changing it with gain in compression, when it rolls, it picks up and you really don't lose camber during that roll. So I mean, this is one of the big advantages with a, a properly designed double wishbone suspension system. You can tune that camber gain and the advantage of course compared to maybe something like a McPherson strut where the camber gain is minimal or you can end up losing camber is that you don't need to run such an aggressive static negative camber but you can still get the advantage of having that tyre flat on the ground uh, when the car's cornering hard. Moving on, another term you mentioned there is motion ratio. This is something that a lot of people overlook or don't understand. Can you give us a, a bit of a rundown on what that term means? Sure. The motion ratio refers to how much the shock travels versus the wheel. So the way we typically measure it is we'll take the shock out and then measure eye to eye with the car just sitting static. And then we'll just put like a one inch block under the tire and then re-measure it. And whatever that measurement is, it tells you what your motion ratio is. So if it's one to one, you'll move the wheel an inch 
and the shock will move an inch. And if it's 1.1, if you overdrive it, the shock will actually move further than the wheel does. Or if it's less, you'll see less. So just one element of that, because again, as I, as I mentioned, it's something that's very easy to completely ignore, but you know, if you do have a motion ratio significantly away from one to one, one of the elements that this affects, of course, is your uh, spring rate and the correct spring rate for your application. People get too hung up on the term spring rate. We're not really that worried about the rate of the spring. What we worry about is the rate, or the wheel rate. So what that does at the, the wheel, when we don't have a one-to-one -one motion ratio, then there's obviously a difference there. So with your setup, the unique element about it is not so much the fact you have this motion ratio, but from what I understand, you can change it and change it quickly. Yes, we've created a system with the rockers where we can change the motion ratio in one tenth increments for three different positions and probably about 10 to 15 minutes total. And it doesn't affect the ride height at all. And it gives us a 10% difference in the overall spring rate. So at certain tracks, we'll see that if we have a little bit more grip or the car is trying to compress too much in the front, we'll need to stiffen it up a little bit. And then if the surface is a little bit less grippy and we aren't able to transfer the energy as well, we can soften it up and then that'll allow the car to remain grippy while not having to change anything else and we're not having to adjust springs which can affect corner balance because we're not affecting the ride height at all we're not affecting the corner balance at all so the change is really nice in that it doesn't create a cascade of problems that are resulting from the, the change Normally when we go and change spring rates, A, it, it's definitely more than a 15 minute job in most instances, but B, as you sort of alluded to there, it's almost certainly going to have an effect on your ride height, which in turn affects your corner weights, which also affects your alignment. So as you say, a bit of a, a knock on effect there and it actually becomes quite a big job. Mm -hmm. All right, so looking at the, the rest of the chassis, we've talked about the front end. Uh, what, what was done in the rear end? Any changes there that are dramatic? Oh yeah, it's got a uh, transaxle in the back because like we said, we really wanted to focus on getting the weight distribution and the polar moment and everything really nice. So the transaxle helps that a bunch. We run a SADF sequential transmission in the back with a ZR1 Corvette diff. And then again, we did our own custom suspension in the back with another cantilever system so that we can get the motion ratio exactly the way we want it. And we can also adjust the anti-squat percentage pretty easily. Everything on the car, all the pickup points on it are adjustable so that we can continually adjust those as we develop the chassis. And we've been you know, developing the chassis for years now, and we still find things that we want to change. Like, I need to do another adjustment to the anti-squat percentage because now that we have more grip and more aero, we're finding that on uh, corner exit, when we're applying throttle, that we're getting just a little bit more squat than we want to see. So we're able to adjust that anti-squat percentage to get the car to be a little bit more stable under that acceleration on the corner exits. All right, coming back to the, the transaxle for a moment, for those who aren't aware, the transaxle simply is the gearbox and differential combined and mm -hmm. uh, re reasonably common these days in, in higher end uh, sort of supercars. You mentioned polar moment of inertia, and this is a term that we don't hear too often. So you're talking about essentially not just the overall weight, but whereabouts the weight is located relative to the, the centre of the car, where the car will rotate around. Mm. So what's the benefit of keeping that polar moment of inertia uh, tight or, or small? So the more that you move the weight towards the ends of the car, the more difficult it is to change it dynamically from like left to right. So the car will transition less bad in it or less well. So what you want to picture in your mind or the way I've always had it described to me is hold like a barbell in your hand that weighs 50 pounds and then try and switch it back and forth in your hand. It's going to be very difficult to turn it. But if you have a 50 pound ball, it's really easy. And that's what polar moment is. So by moving the weight and the mass towards the center of the car, the car has a much easier time transitioning dynamically and changing direction without having to have this pendulum effect of the weight swinging out at the ends of the car. Okay, that's a great description there. In terms of getting the weight balance as well front to rear, not just your polar moment of inertia where you want it to be, uh, it looks like that engine has been moved back a fair way in the, in the chassis. Essentially everything is actually rearward of the uh, front axle line now. I take it that's intentional and not how uh, GM actually intended this car to be? No, GM had the engine about 10 or 11 inches further far forward in the factory car. And that was one of the things that we wanted to do was to get that back because that helps with multiple things. It gets the overall weight balance more centralized and it also helps with that polar moment because the tires really want to be able to react to that weight in the middle of them. 
All right, let's talk a little bit about the engine. I mean, at a glance we can see it's LS based, but of course there's, there's a huge range of options when it comes to uh, parts, both factory and aftermarket for these engines. So give us a rundown on that combination you're running. So the engine is based around an LS7 architecture. It runs a Dart block. The Dart aluminum block is a lot stronger. It allows us to run a six bolt cylinder head and we run a GM Performance Parts LS ba or LS7 based cylinder head as well. Those cylinder heads were basically raw castings and Brett at Land Speed Development came up with a custom port design just for this engine. This engine has been developed to be able to work well at multiple different altitudes. And there's a lot of things that you know, originally we hadn't considered with how tricky it is to get an engine to be able to run well from sea level all the way up to 14,500 feet. But a lot of little tricks can be played with cylinder head design, camshaft design, all of that to kind of make the car have an easier time to spool and to have more torque down low because that's the real tricky part when you're at a hill climb like that is everybody tends to lose a lot of their low end torque and they have a lot of problem coming off the corners and a lot of those corners are 180 degree switchbacks and you do many of them. So any tenth of a second you can find in coming off of those corners is a benefit. So we've developed a lot of the engine around that. How do we get the torque of the engine to be very broad and to be able to stay in that window for the whole run? And we did that with the cam, the cylinder heads, you know, the intake manifold. It's got a Sean's custom alloy, really nice billet intake manifold on it that does a really good job of giving us even fueling and airflow. And then we also did that with the exhaust. We played around with a couple different versions of exhaust where at first I was thinking if we did really low volume tight exhaust, it would help with spool. But we found that the engine actually likes a larger, more NA header on it. That's actually, this thing has long tube headers that are 25 inch primaries that you typically wouldn't see on a turbo car, but we found that it really helped with that torque in the lower RPMs and actually added to the spool, even though the volume of the manifolds were significantly more. So essentially, in terms of that exhaust design, it's almost like a naturally aspirated design with a turbo added onto it. Correct. And it was not what I initially thought would work well, but we went through and fought a lot of pressure differential issues where we were seeing really high exhaust pressures versus what we were seeing in the intake side. And it wasn't ideal and we knew it was adding heat and it was adding significant heat and we had problems with EGTs and then we weren't running efficiently because we had a bad pressure differential across the exhaust to the intake. So this header system cleared that up a lot, gave us a whole bunch more power everywhere and it was just one of those kind of surprising things. So I learned. Well, that's probably a good thing to stumble upon anyway. Uh, the turbocharger there, obviously, that's the key to, to making the power. The engine's just there, really, to, to support it. So what is the turbo that you've got on, on the engine? So the turbo is a Garrett 88 millimeter big body turbo. It's a really large turbo, and typically it would be too large for that combination. If you were to look at building this car for running at sea level and time attack, you'd be like, there's no reason you need an 88 millimeter turbo on it. But we need that mass flow at 14,000 feet because as the density decreases, we need to increase the pressure ratio. So we need a really large compressor to be able to get enough airflow through it to be able to manage at that altitude. So for, for those who maybe aren't understanding there, Pike's Peak is, is really torturous. The, the air pressure, even at the start line, is incredibly low. The higher you go, the less air pressure there is. And it's that pressure ratio, the ratio of the compressor outlet pressure, which is what we normally think of when we're thinking of boost, uh, divided by the inlet pressure. That's the pressure ratio. So essentially, if we want to maintain the same inlet manifold pressure, the, the turbo pressure, boost pressure the engine's seeing, then the higher we go, the, the harder we need to work. The turbo correct so that's why you've chosen this turbo yeah and a lot of people kind of are in a in a pickle when they're at the hill climb because you really want this large turbo to be able to maintain the pressure ratio and get the mass flow that you need of air but the problem with that is you can't spool it and then the car won't spool it's boggy all the time and then like we talked about coming off the corners it won't do it because it's out of boost so you have to come up with a, a clever solution sometimes to go okay how am i going to get this gigantic turbo to spool at really low air density at high altitude so we came up with what i feel like is a pretty 
clever solution to that. Let's talk about that because obviously anti-lag itself is nothing particularly unusual. That, that technology generally relies on leaving the throttle body open a little bit, getting some airflow through the engine and then using a combination of ignition retard and ignition cut to get unburned fuel and air out combusting in the exhaust manifold thereby providing energy to the turbocharger. So this has been used on rally cars for, for decades, nothing new. You've gone uh, a little bit further with this with a, a rocket style anti-lag system. Uh, I know some people like ProDrive use this in the World Rally Championship. Tell us what a rocket anti-lag actually is and how it works. So a rocket anti-lag in its purest form is truly like a jet combustor that's right before the turbocharger. And there's a lot of math involved, and fortunately one of our friends used to work at ProDrive and might know a thing or two about that math. So the rocket does a fantastic job of once you bypass the air, like your bypass valve circulates into the rocket and then builds pressure in there, lights, ignites, and then the actual thrust from the rocket is what spools the turbo and keeps it spooled. And you can actually run your turbo almost as a closed loop jet engine is what you're doing. And then the piston engine is just kind of idling while the rocket takes care of keeping the RPM in the turbocharger. Let's come back to conventional anti-lag for a moment so we can sort of get a bit of a comparison. So conventional anti-lag, as I mentioned, normally we, we need the throttle body cracked open to get the airflow. Yes, there is fresh air style as well, but we'll get to that. And then we've got the, the fuel and air combusting. So one of the, the downsides is there really is a limit to how much boost pressure or additional response we can get in that way before we have to open the throttle body too far and the car is difficult to drive, it just pushes on. Uh, the other element is it, it creates a lot of heat and stress on the engine and the exhaust ports, it's not that great for the engine. So this gets rid of that element because for a start you're actually introducing fresh air using an external wastegate straight into the rocket, correct? Yes, the rocket on ours, we call it kind of a baby rocket. It's a very, very simple rocket compared to what the typical, I guess like, it's hard to say typical with rocket anti-lags, but you know, a, a more conventional rocket style anti-lag is far more complex than what we've designed. We've kind of worked on trying to simplify it and make it more basic so that it has less moving parts and it's easier to replace because rockets tend to be kind of a wear item. They don't last too long because they get really, really, really hot. But the advantage of the rocket versus a, just a traditional fresh air anti-lag is that we're not seeing that heat in the whole manifold. We're able to actually focus the heat in the rocket right before the turbo, so we're not going to see as much manifold damage and things like that that you're kind of synonymous with your typical fresh air anti-lag systems. So the rocket works really well for that, but it's kind of interesting because if you just do the math on the traditional ways that you would build a rocket, our system shouldn't work, but it does and it works phenomenally well, so we have to actually do more experimenting to figure out. We want to know why is this working so that we can kind of apply it and try and make it even better but it, it's exceeded all of our expectations with how well it works. Like this, this thing, we could have the air cracked only enough to do like 15 to 1800 RPM and get 10 pounds of boost. So it's really nice for the hill climb to be able to, like when we're coming out of those corners, you know, we're looking at 10 pounds of boost where other people might drop all the way down to ambient and ambient there can be as low as eight PSI absolute. Okay. so. Instant response, absolutely no lag, makes a lot of sense. In terms of the control strategy, we're actually to come back one step from that. We, we talked about the fresh air introduction into the, the rocket, obviously that's one element necessary from combustion, for combustion. The other element, element is we need fuel. So how are you actually getting the, the fuel through the, the system into that rocket? So I gotta give a shout out to Tim at Motorsport Electronics because a lot of that is all his brainchild for the Motec M150. But basically we'll do an ignition cut while still fueling the cylinder. He fuels it you know, at different percentages while the cut is active, but that introduces the fuel into the exhaust. And then we'll do a really retarded fire on other cylinders so that it will actually light in the exhaust. And then that heat, once it warms up the rocket, the rocket has some stuff internally in it with some temp probes and things that actually act like glow plug and will start the combustion in the rocket itself. So once that combustion is occurring inside the rocket, you, you don't actually need anything else to sustain it. It, it becomes self-sustaining. Yeah, it's really wild because when it like, 
the rocket lights, like once it gets hot enough, you'll hear the rocket light and the car sounds like a jet engine. It doesn't sound like a piston engine anymore. And it just is like shooting fire out the side and we could put the boost wherever we want. Like it'll, it actually opens the wastegate on the rocket. Uh, talking about control there, you, you've got the external wastegate being used to introduce the, the air into the rocket. Obviously, uh, through the MoTeC ECU, I'm assuming you've got pretty thorough control of how much fuel's going through the engine. So what are you doing with that wastegate? Is it just open or closed, or is it pulse width modulated? And are you targeting a specific air fuel ratio? Are you targeting a specific exhaust gas temperature pre-turbine? Yeah, how, how, what are your control levers that you're yes. pulling? <laughs> yes, all of those Thank you things. for clearing that up. <laughs> yeah, so we have temperature and pressure probes before and after the rocket and also air fuel before and after the rocket. So we know kind of what the difference is across the rocket for all of those things. And it is a very sweet spot. There's a perfect uh, air fuel ratio that it likes and temperatures that it likes. Because if we get it too hot, it'll cause damage to the rocket and it'll cause damage to the turbo. But the hotter it is, the more efficient it is. So we really want to run it as hot as we can, but we try to manage that temperature through fueling and air introduction. And sometimes you can, you know, alter how much air is going in there because we do pulse width modulate the valve on the fresh air valve. And then you can also sometimes that fresh air is acting to cool the rocket. So you may not want to dial back the fresh air, you may want to open the wastegate. So there's a really complex balance there and we've got a lot of time in doing it. And I know that Tim would probably get mad at me if I gave up too many secrets, but there are a lot of tools at his disposal with the ignition cut, how we have the engine throttled versus how much fuel is in it versus how we're throttling the valve. And we found kind of a really nice balance where we can hold the rocket right at about 900 C, which is our target. And then it'll just kind of shut itself down if it runs away. Because sometimes on things like that, there's latency in the control strategies. And if you have that latency, we want to just kind of shut it down so that we don't cause damage to any of the components. Speaking of that control strategy, I'm going to assume here that this is not running production MoTeC firmware, uh, something a little bit special to give the control strategies required for the rocket anti-lag. Yeah, Tim developed the control strategy himself and it's his package. So my ECU is a development ECU, so we're able to do pretty much whatever. And we kind of all sit around at the table or around the car and we go, well, what if we do this and what if we do that? And then they'll write it right into the firmware and we'll test it. And the uh, it was kind of a real trick to get it all to work correctly because, you know, like the common problem with anti-lag having run on and the car having a paddle shift, those strategies sometimes didn't play well together. So we had to do a lot of tweaking in the firmware package to get it where the anti-lag strategy would allow the car to shift because you would do things with the throttle control for the anti-lag that would negate a shift and there was all kinds of stuff. So you have to work on what is the priority in different circumstances, you know, is the anti-lag have priority or does the shift have priority? And so it was, it was quite complicated, but now that it's all working, it's like the jam. It is so perfect. It does sound like the dream. Let's talk about the reliability of the unit because off camera you mentioned that this is actually a prototype that you sort of threw together, never expecting it to work and, and it just did so it's still on the car. I assume on that basis that it has proven to be reliable. I just worry about the amount of heat being produced in, in such a short area. I mean, exhaust manifolds on turbocharged cars get beat up all the time anyway. This is only gonna make matters worse. So how have you found that reliability? We've been exceptionally surprised with how reliable it's been. So normally people, when they'll run these types of systems, will run exotic materials like Inconel or 321 at least. And we actually are only running 304 because we figured, okay, this is a complicated enough system. We're not gonna get it right the first time. I'm gonna use a bit of a cheaper material, a little easier to work with, kind of get the first sketch out of the way, figure out what we wanna change, get it till we get it right. Then we can build it out of the exotic materials. But we've been looking at it and we've run it pretty consistently with that just 304 material and we haven't had any cracking or anything. So I think part of what helps it is we're able to focus that heat into one specific area of the manifold. And that area of the manifold has the fresh air flowing through it. So we're actually actively cooling the manifold all the time. So I think that that's what's led to the good reliability. 
makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, obviously, this is an area where there's not a lot of information on how to build your own rocket anti-lag system, and I don't expect you to divulge all of your secrets here. Uh, are there any resources out there freely available on the internet with a little bit more information if our viewers want to sort of dive in and figure, figure out a little bit more what's enclosed inside that little secret chamber? You kind of have to go into the deep, dark corners of the web, and it's hard to find. And it's difficult to get all of the math right, but I found that if you look a lot towards what they do with jet combustors, that has a lot of kind of how it's supposed to work, but there's a lot of math involved that I'll be honest, I don't even know because Matt doesn't tell me that. Matt, Matt's the guy that used to work on those systems and you know so, so basically the tip is find a friend from ProDrive and lean yeah. heavily on their experience and get them to do the heavy lifting of the math yeah that's certainly a good way to go about it that seems like it's us. worked for you yeah yeah that worked really well I mean the math is available you know the stuff can be figured out but it is certainly not something that you know the casual hobbyist is going to be able to figure out easily uh, we have talked with Matt and Tim because we're like well if this works as well as it does we should figure out how to build them for different size turbos and offer it you know as a hey here's a MoTeC package and here's a rocket you know yeah, so absolutely. that has been talked about because it works phenomenally well you know the market of it would be people that are doing similar stuff you know where they need to have that really big compressor and have a way to keep it spooled so it's not really necessary for if you're just going to do sea level type time attack things like that but if you do have kind of those crazy circumstances like what we have with the hill climb it is a huge advantage and you know maybe sometime we'll like release it as a product to, to people i mean as you say it's a niche product that's not going to suit everyone but if you need it absolutely this is an amazing way to get a great response out of a, a really large turbo Look, thanks for your time giving us a bit of a rundown on that, Mike. Really exciting to actually see that technology out there in the wild. And uh, yeah, really appreciate you explaining how it works. Thanks a lot. It was great talking to you. If you like that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.